Good morning. Um, I have the uh, privilege to introduce uh, the speaker for the next session. Um, uh, Professor uh, Bonaiuto from um, the University of Rome uh, comes from a family of psychologists who are all dedicated in one way or the other to positive psychology, although they are not officially, but that's their work. Uh, Marino, who is here with us, we, is um, the vice president of the European um, uh, Association of uh, em Environmental or Psychology, and he has done very important work on looking at how the natural and the built environment affects uh, people's moods and, uh, and the social connections that form in different types of environments and uh, what can be done to change those environments to improve the quality of both social relationships and personal uh, experience. So in many ways, um, Professor Bonaiuto is um, uh, one of the most um, experienced and important people in this field that which we hope that positive psychology will become more and more active in, namely the way in which we create a place, a world, and communities where life is worth living, where people uh, can express themselves and uh, interact in ways that are um, growth producing, meaningful, rather than just simply comfortable and, and so forth. Before passing on the um, mic to Professor Bonaiuto, I, I should add that after this meeting, there's going to be a conversation opportunity uh, over lunch. So, if you want to continue talking about these issues, you are invited to pick up your lunch at the, in the Pasadena room. Pasadena room is uh, that big room where the, uh, yesterday, last night, we had um, uh, refreshments. You pick up the lunch there, and then you go to the San Fernando room where we can uh, which that room will be dedicated for us to have lunch and talk about um, environmental issues and positive psychology. If you have questions about it afterwards, please ask the questions. But at this point, I, I'm, as I said, very glad and privileged to introduce my friend, uh, Dr. Bonaiuto. Thank you very much. So I'm full of technology here. Um, got a pointer, got a something for the slides and the microphone. So everything seems to work. So um, thank you a lot. Thank you, Mike. Thank you all the organizers for having invited me here and having the possibility of sharing uh, our work. Uh, it's not simply my work because it's a shared work with many pe other people. I will give you a brief overview where I work, with whom, and then I will enter more closely the, the topic of today. Um, so I chose this title, Positive Environments, actually plural, since I'm going to uh, bring you quite around the world, basically, on seeing different things and, and different kinds of environments. Um, I belong to this university, which is Sapienza University of Rome, which is the largest university in Italy, but I think also in, in Europe, at least in, term, in quantitative terms, in number of people, staff, and students. And particularly to this department, Department of Social and um, Developmental Processes of Psychology, and um, uh, also an inter-university research center. So just give you, spend a few slides to tell uh, where I am. So I'm based in Rome. Our faculty is a medicine and the psychology faculty, which is a little bit of medicine, not all uh, medicine in our university. Three departments of medicine and three departments of psychology. Um, and we are uh, uh, in, in, in the social and developmental psychology department, as I told you. Um, 
Uh, we also have an inter-university research center for environmental psychology, which we started a few years ago, exactly to give visibility to this topic, to this discipline. Um, and uh, we started actually in 2005 uh, with uh, three main partners you will find on the right side. So Sapienza, which is the main uh, administrative uh, place, plus Padua in the north and Cagliari. Uh, since uh, there were based uh, other people that were sharing uh, this kind of discipline, this kind of interest and knowledge with us. So basically it was a way to give a, a formal institutional role to such a kind of network, which was mainly a knowledge and scientific network. Then later on, other three partners joined us, so two other universities in Rome and uh, one university in Naples, and we have also contact with people in Milan, which are not still officially and, and down in south. Um, these are some of the persons I work with. So the, the, the Inter-University Research Center is quite large, and some of the ties, some of the links are more strong with some of the people, and you would find some here. Mirilla Bonnes was the one which uh, I shared the, the, the founding of this, and some other researchers in different places or short-term contracts, which I'm working most, more closely during these last months. But in the network of the people is, is larger, and some ties are more stronger with these people and some are less. We look a lot for funds because we are not a department, so we have no institutional funds, so we need to fund our research, our activities, and a good deal comes from what is in blue here. It's European Union research funding, um, and all uh, the topics are, had to do with uh, mostly environmental issues. Uh, some other companies, like the red ones, some other examples are local um, institutional public uh, institution, or some like black and, and gray are national funding institutions such, such as a ministry or university. Um, and uh, so this gives you an idea that uh, most of our funded uh, are within our country, in Italy or Europe, or sometimes we have some connection. But, and uh, some other uh, research activities are actually without funds, but we are, they, you know, are helped by uh, connections. And more recently we are uh, uh, having uh, nice networks also in Middle East and Asia, and maybe I will give you a few examples uh, during the speech. On the website, you will find a, a list of topics we cover in our inter-university research center, which basically span uh, all over the possibilities of environmental psychology from basic processes like perception and memory about places up to social psychological interaction, social identity within places, uh, um, um, tourism, uh, technology, so many different kinds of which are covered within environmental uh, psychology or, if you wish, how methods and uh, knowledge in psychology can be useful to improve designing or management of different kinds of places, either built or natural. Um, myself, I will focus mainly on uh, stuff here in this speech which belongs to my environmental psychology interests and research track. But I actually have an interest in, in communication, both interpersonal, uh, nonverbal communication, and organizational, as well in work and organization. And actually, I will pay tribute more to the first uh, uh, research interest I have, although I must say that some of the development in communication, work, and organization had a great importance, have a great importance also for environmental psychology, because, you know, I will speak mostly of a, say, physical and social environment, but there is. A, uh, a, a great deal of new research about normative environments, so how um, norms uh, are communicated within groups of people, within community of people, and I'm not focusing so much in this uh, conference, so I'm just paying tribute saying that there is other uh, issues like normative environments which are uh, extremely important, and, and, uh, yeah, but, but I'm sure there are, uh, during the track, this, this conference, uh, those topics are covered as well. Uh, so I spent already about 10% of my presentation, so I will give another 10% to introduce the topic. And the most of the presentation in the slides will be about uh, examples, example of researches and um, let's say case studies or experience, which can help us understanding how specific place can be approached in a, let's say, positive way. And final 10%, just few concluding remarks at the end of my presentation. Um, so, uh, we have been hearing already, I think yesterday in the opening session, but also this morning, um, how positive psychology and environmental psychology can be mutually relevant. And actually, one important, uh, some important things have been said already yesterday, 
uh, by Seligman, for example, in the opening section, how uh, positive psychology, as you well known, uh, uh, stressed the importance of a positive approach uh, for, research, for science and for research activities. And how this uh, basically uh, points to a salutogenic, salutogenic approach uh, that is uh, focusing more on health and quality of life rather than on risk and heal uh, as they come uh, from either personal or environmental issues. Um, there is also uh, already uh, a publication which dates back of one year ago by a co Mexican colleague who is also here, and we are actually having uh, in, in one uh, hour a discussion about his paper. He published uh, um, a paper about uh, positive psychology of sustainability, which is very much near to my talk today, uh, but I will try to expand a little bit. So I will give a, a different bit of approach on this. So on these trends that emphasize the importance of positive approach also within environmental psychology, but trying to uh, enlarge a little bit. And, and thanks God, I mean, it's very useful that we will have uh, later on a, a specific section, I think, focusing on this. Um, uh, comparing with the, um, uh, Coral Verdugo, uh, Positive Psychology of Sustainability, I want to uh, specify what he was uh, already uh, saying in that paper. If we uh, take his argument, I think we can enlarge uh, the possibility of uh, uh, mutual reciprocity and usefulness of positive psychology and environmental psychology, taking a distinction, which I'm proposing right now here, between environmental positive psychology and positive environmental psychology. Um, so the first one, environmental positive psychology, I would say is a positive psychology which stress or put attention more on the environment. So I would say it starts from positive psychology and arrives to, in, uh, to be interested and to apply positive psychology knowledge to the environment. So I would say, I would say it focuses more on the person and on its uh, or her, his, positive relations with the environment, starting from uh, studying which all the constructs and processes which are within uh, positive psychology, such as flow, identity, engagement, happiness, motivation, etc., and found the way how these can be relevant for a better world, for a better place to live in. So how this could be relevant for nature, sustainability, and environmental education, for example. So if we can summarize in a sentence, I think Environmental positive psychology could be something about uh, how a positive person can create a positive environment. Now, I think there is also another opportunity to be exploited that is a positive environmental psychology. And if you wish, this starts more from environmental psychology and it arrives to positive psychology and to the person. So I would say it focuses more on the environment and how uh, the environment can have positive relationship with the person and improve or emphasize the positivity of the person. So places and their environmental features can be relevant and specifically positively relevant for the development of the person, for its or his performance, satisfaction, well-being, happiness. So if you wish positive environmental psychology now, as a different focus, is how a positive environment can create a positive person. So, you see, it's kind of reciprocal or complementary with, with the previous one. And I will focus mainly on positive environmental psychology. But I think that most of the section that we will have during this conference will give a lot of example of environmental positive psychology. And actually, this is, uh, I think, uh, Jim Myers was also giving uh, around a, a paper with all the uh, possibilities that this conference gives you to go uh, deep and uh, having a full treatment uh, in both sides of uh, environmental and positive psychology. Um, so we had already a, a session this morning early. Now we have this talk. We have a lunch break. And then we have a symposium and paper section and poster section. So we have many different opportunities during this conference to match the two uh, and the cross-border the two disciplines. Um, so this will be, I think, most of the work presented in these opportunities during these three days will be mostly environmental positive psychology. Now I want to focus more on positive environmental psychology within this talk. This is a bit of a stretch. I mean, uh, 
uh, extreme, but I, so there can be also some overlap, but just for the sake of the presentation, I'm emphasizing this. Um, this is the first example. I usually, usually, usually use this with students because uh, it dates back to an old stu study published in JPSP, but I think it's very good because for students particularly because it focuses on a student sample, so students uh, living uh, in, in universities. But give you an, um, an idea of, uh, actually, one of the possible risks or criticism that has been made about, uh, uh, about positive environmental psychology. That is the risk of architectural determinism. I mean, Obviously, not 100%, not all of our behavior depends from the place where we live. But, you know, this has been contrasted uh, maybe too much. And there is a lot of evidence which, in fact, says uh, or show us that our behavior is affected by the place where we are. And this is a good example. This is a residence in weeks of the students in the um, uh, university dormitories. And this is the percentage of their behavior classified as social. And as you can see, the um, researchers here uh, randomized students in three different conditions. Uh, a dormitory with a long corridor, so less possibility of interaction, or other two solutions, a long corridor with, uh, which has been shortened, or a new building with a short corridor. So they manipulated the high density or low density of their living, and they found that, you see, as time increases, and people live there quite a lot of uh, weeks and months, uh, the percentage of behavior de uh, decreases around 35% for those in the long corridor solution, while stays up to 60 or 65% for the other two conditions. So this means that, and it's stabilized, you see the trend stabilized after a while. So this means that uh, some architectural features actually affect social behavior of people. Researchers here look at this effect in situ, but also they looked at in this table, you have nice results about uh, how this living condition affects social behavior also in another situation. So they asked these students to come in a lab for a study, for a study, to take part in a lab study. And they were asked to wait in the waiting room before the lab uh, uh, study experiments. And they were actually measuring how many seats were sitting away from a confederate, if they were looking in, 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 in the eye of the confederate, and if they were showing discomfort sign, nonverbal discomfort sign. And what they see is those people that were already uh, less social in situ, they were also uh, less social here. You see, they sit to a long, uh, to, at a longer distance from the confederate. They look her or his much less, 18 seconds rather than 50 seconds, and they show much more discomfort. So this example of studies show how uh, specific architectural features can change social behavior and can also have an effect on other kind of situation. Now, uh, architectural determinism is not true 100%, but as you have seen in this study, can be uh, effective in some circumstances. And this is a sentence which depicted, I think, this idea in a more complex way, that is in a more uh, round feedback way, that is, uh, our dwellings shape us, but also we shape our dwellings. So we shape our dwellings, and afterwards our dwellings shape us. was said on this occasion. This was the Second World War, and this was the House of Commons in, in Britain, in London. This was before, and then in uh, 1941 it has been bombed as many other uh, areas of that town and destroyed. And then people reacted and they rebuilt the new one, similar to the first one, exactly where it was. And uh, this gives the idea that, uh, and this, sorry, this sentence was given by this man, which was actually the first one who managed to stop the Nazis during the uh, English battle between 30, 1939 and 1940. Um, and uh, he's credited with this sentence, although with, with slight differences, either uh, we shape our dwellings and afterward our dwellings shape us or uh, our buildings. And uh, Winston Churchill, Sir Winston Churchill, uh, uh, was, I think, highlighting very well the reciprocity between man and environment. That is, it's true, the environment is affecting us, but it's also us creating our own environment. So there is a, not simply an archi a purely architectural determinism, but a reciprocal and, uh, uh, feedback between people and, and environment. 
And uh, coming back to Coral Verdugo uh, paper in 2012, he proposed this uh, general uh, conceptual framework to summarize how uh, is it possible to talk about uh, a positive psychology of sustainability. And I would agree that uh, my proposal of uh, an environmental positive psychology or a positive environmental psychology has to deal with the two different parts of this diagram. So what I'm talking right now that is a positive environmental psycho uh, psychology would be this part. So the positive environment having positive uh, consequences on the person. But we have also a second part of the diagram where is the person emotions and behaviors and cognition which can have a positive effect on the environment in terms of sustainability. So I think that uh, it's possible to uh, elaborate his model within these two parts, which actually uh, depict uh, the two uh, points I was just making of positive environmental psychology and environmental positive psychology. Um, this is a, another uh, conceptual model. We just, uh, incidentally, it was the same year uh, we proposed a chapter about residential environments. It's together with a Turkish colleague uh, on the um, Oxford Handbook of Environmental Conservationist Psychologists. And we're basically ex uh, developing this idea, saying that uh, in, in uh, residential environments, it's uh, people and environment actually joining together and through their activities, there are f affordances to which all of those activities of people. And what is most important is that the environmental fit of misfit between people and the environment. So whether needs or features of people and, and the environment matches, so is there a fit or a misfit? So is the, the possibility of talking about uh, whether the environment, for example, uh, pose uh, obstacles, uh, barriers to this, or whether it promotes this? So whether there is a fit, a promotional fit, or uh, uh, some obstacles, some difficulties in this. And this could lead to quality of life and positive consequences on the person. Um, in environmental psychology, we talk uh, more than talking of, of the environment. We tend to talk about place. Because in environmental psychology, actually, place is built up by, let's say, the physical features of the environment but also cognitive, affective, and actions that the person carry out with that environment, in that environment. So rather than talking of purely environment, we tend to use the term place, which help us to understand that the environment is not simply out there, but it's something in transaction with persons, with the person, cognition, and affect, and action. And which places can be important? Obviously, there are many kinds of different places. So these tables gives a, a hint of which are possible important places. Because these tables, these come from Eurostat, so hard data, how people spend their time, and uh, what are they doing. So you see the work study, and these are many different European countries. So small difference between countries, but these are the most used uh, activities. Work and study, domestic work, travel, sleep, meals, personal care, free time. So you can imagine the year there are major places where we spend time. So offices and school or workplace and schools, houses and neighborhood, residential places, commuting travels, and a range of possible places where we have free times you know, from shopping to museums uh, uh, and uh, nature, out places, etc. And this is matched uh, also, if you go to this, this was the handbook I was quoting before for our uh, conceptual model. Uh, it's the Oxford Handbook of Environmental Psych and Conservation Psychology published recently, just last year. And as many other um, handbook in environmental psychology, they map different kind of places. You know, they have several uh, chapters and some of these chapters are focusing on specific places. Uh, so there is a very long uh, kind of um, list of possible important places. And now here, for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to focus on just on a few of them. So home and residence, neighborhood and community, workplace, school, and natural place. Uh, there are many others, but I have not time. So what I'm going to do is now is entering these five places, basically, 
and showing for each place an example of research which is, I would say, more traditional, less oriented toward positive uh, environmental psychology. Um, and also some example of our own works, both in terms of research, but also of uh, case study or example of real places which can highlight some features of uh, our discussion. So I was thinking I will, I will bring you around the world during these uh, places because uh, I will show uh, these green dots are referring to researcher or researchers of places where, which I will show you with picture of uh, data or qualitative or quantitative data. And I must say, as you can see, they are not covering exactly of the world. So there is a, a north-south bias. So it will be much more in the north hemisphere than the south. And also a west-east bias. So it's more on the west side, west, west and north than the rest of the world. But I try to feel, find some example here. And this is by no means uh, representative of what you know, you can find in, in the literature which is really vast or even in other kind of experiences. So let's start with home and residence. I will show you a couple of examples of research from uh, US and Canada and, and Austria. Also the first one actually is Austria. So this uh, is a, a first data, let's say I would say a traditional data, which is carried out by a very good research at Cornell University. We also collaborated with him, Gary Evans. He is showing in this uh, work uh, on a sample of um, Austrian children that uh, the more the noise, you see the, the, the increase of the noise and the lowering of psychological health scale, especially if the children is biologically at risk, considering some measures uh, which belongs to her initial uh, life. If the ch child is not so biological risk, this affects it uh, counterbalanced, so it, it does not appear. But this shows an example of how a negative features of the environment uh, decreases a uh, increases a risk for the person. This is, I would say, uh, an example of, a, of a, a positive environmental psychology that is uh, taken from Chisholm Mihai uh, and Rochberg Alton 1981 book. So it was about the meaning of things which was translated in Italian as well, and this table actually referring to the Italian edition. And as you can see, it was showing the percentage and how it, you can correlate the actual features of your home environment, such as furniture, visual art, sculpture, musical instruments, photography, uh, and other issue books, plants, etc., to a number of positive things, positive features from a psychological point of view, such as memory, experiences, uh, um, qualities or self, uh, our own familiar groups, relatives, etc. So it's, a, it's basically showing how material components of our environment are actually related to a number of positive uh, features of our life and, and psychology. Um, and this has been also recent, uh, later on expanded uh, by other authors like Cooper Marcus, for example, saying that there is uh, uh, domestic objects in the home uh, are important to generate positive emotion. They can evoke memories, facilitate a variety of activities, and contribute to flow. So there are evidence that specific material features of the environment can have a positive consequence uh, uh, on people. And this is a concrete example, so it's not a research example, but actually a case study, which I learned just a couple of weeks ago. I was in China for another meeting, and I met this lady, Elizabeth Liz Glenn. She is deputy director of Baltimore County, so here in the US. I think she has a terrific program in planning and development of community shared service center, working with National Association of Housing and Redevelopment officials, and also with uh, non-governmental uh, bodies. She's doing uh, uh, this for about 10 years, and um, it follows uh, a, a method which uh, is based on a participatory process. You can see many pictures here it's going from civic engagement to open dialogue, uh, uh, plan consensus, uh, et cetera, from you know, very preliminary phases in the plan in the office to actual work in the, in the real world in the, where the houses were. And uh, she, uh, she uh, basically were doing this, both gaining, uh, respecting sustainability and energy efficiency standards. So they were 
uh, taking care of any, um, sustainability in uh, doing this, but also uh, in a m more broad way, that is uh, having a community approved design guidelines uh, for reconstructing or constructing these homes. So they went through a list of how these homes should look like in order to respect the will, the desire, the history of the place for that community. And these are examples, and they had two different options. Some, in some cases, these were how the community was a, a, a very poor place, uh, East Towson, out in Baltimore. Uh, this was a picture from the 50s. And uh, sometimes they rebuilt the house, and in many cases, uh, and whenever it was possible, they actually restored the already existing houses, like in the example here below. And this had a, a number of uh, positive uh, consequences on the community, not simply on a psychological or on sociological or anthropological point of view, but also in an economical way. You see examples here of a house price from 2007 to 2011. In some cases, they are three times the original value. In some other cases, two times the original financial value. Now, other examples. Uh, that was about a uh, home environment. These are more neighborhood environments, so a little bit larger around the house. And we are going here more in Europe. So example, from one research, more traditional in Berlin, another one South uh, Sweden, and some cases from our own activities in Italy, and, uh, which also spread in other countries. Um, this was more traditional, let's say, ill prevention. So stressing about uh, studying and neighborhood factors and how these are important in terms of risks or negative consequences, in terms of air pollution, traffic noise, also some positive features here. But you see, when they come to a model, some, most of the literature, they tend to focus on negative uh, problems, issues, risks, such as which are the stressors, stressors are perceived and, and there is a stress appraisal, then there can be personal and situational factors which moderate or, uh, these effects. But finally, you see the focus quite often is uh, impaired satisfaction with neighborhood, poor health behavior, and answered health risks. So very similar to the study uh, in, on home before that I showed you about the children in, in, uh, in Austria. So similar approach, focusing on the risk and ill prevention. This is a, a different example. This is from uh, southern of Sweden, and they were studying the environment when the environment presents a number of recreational values. So these are objective evaluation on a very large sample of people, 12,000 persons. So they were measuring whether they have a, a no or a low number of these recreational objective features in the environment, or a higher, like four or five of these. And they were showing how neighborhood satisfaction but also time spent in physical activities increases uh, when these uh, recreational values objectively present in the environment increase. So the more the, let's say, positive actual features of the environment are, the more the satisfaction, the more the physical activity of the person uh, increases. And this uh, strand of literature now, it's, it's, it's quite uh, well developing. Uh, these are other researchers like um, Ward Thompson, she's in Scotland, and, they show, and she's working a lot of walkability. So mobility uh, can be uh, increased through environmental intervention and has strong therapeutic uh, uh, consequences. Corpela has made also an interesting point. He, he's saying uh, uh, that um, it, we could also think to have intervention in terms of favorite place prescription. So, if we are able to, let's say, describe or recognize some places as positive places, or positive, which has positive consequences for, for the person, we can have like a prescription of spending time in those places for having positive consequences on the person. Uh, we also had, uh, I'm, I'm not focusing on another strand of works we have just mentioning about urban pragmatics. Just to say that there is an important caveat here to be made. Uh, sometimes it's not simply the specific place which is important, but the fact that we, our activities spread across places. So actually in some researches we have seen that what we have is not simply activity in a place, but a complex system of urban pragmatics, which bring us along different places. 
And uh, this kind of system of urban pragmatics can be more or less complicated. And some people tend to have a very simple pragmatic, which sticks to just one place or two places. Some other people have a more complex system of urban pragmatics, and they tend to use many places. So they are less confined in one place. So this is just to say that many people tend to focus just on one place at a time, but actually this research shows that we have complex system of multi-place activities, actually. These are examples of our research on neighborhood. Uh, we, we have done a lot of this, so just give you just a few examples. One thing that we have tried to make is to build up a, a tool, scales, which can be measure, can measure how people perceive and evaluate the neighborhood environment. And after many uh, research on this, this is just one published uh, uh, in the European Review of Applied Psychology and a large uh, Italian sample of different towns, but that was replicated in many different places, shows that there are a number of uh, uh, fixed uh, indicators. Some of those pertain to the architectural and urban planning features, among which green, some other to the social community of the neighborhood, some other to the services available in the neighborhood, and some other to the more contextual features of the neighborhood, such as upkeeping, maintenance, pollution, way of life in the neighborhood. So many different research told us that these 19 indicators are always considered by people when they assess their neighborhood. And they can be used, for example, to predict whether or not people would be satisfied about their neighborhood or whether they will develop attachment for the neighborhood. This is an interesting construct, neighborhood attachment. It's developed by the same idea of attachment for, per for people, for persons. And uh, uh, since 1963, uh, after field research that discovered that people were grieving after uh, being relocated, there is a literature showing the, how people actually develop bonds with their own places, as if the place is a person. So if you want to increase satisfaction but also attachment of the person, there are some of those indicators that count more. So this can be useful, for example, for neighborhood or urban life management, because tell us that some out of those 19 are more important in predicting neighborhood attachment. So if you want to invest, for example, time and money in um, working, improving the quality of the neighborhood, maybe some of these, like these features, are more important than other features in the neighborhood. And we are now extending this research and basically trying to replicate them. For example, this is a submitted paper in Chinese, uh, working with the same similar uh, scales in different places in, uh, all over the world, for France, Spain, Portugal, Sweden, Croatia, Turkey, Iran in two different languages, China, Australia. So, and some of the results of radio analysis like China or um, France, Spain, etc., show the, those indicators uh, holds true also for those population. Although this does not mean that they evaluate the same thing in the same way, but simply that they use the same feature, they evaluate the same feature that is important. Then they obviously can give different priorities, but the, the way they look at the environment is more or less the same. And this is an example of uh, some Swiss, uh, sorry, Finnish co colleagues, Marketa Kita, who basically uh, took our model, though in the, very, in the main features, not in the detailed features. So the four main features I was showing before in the four colors, the green, the blue, the yellow, and the red. And she's uh, measuring in a uh, very large data set through mobile system and, and mobile technology how people uh, positively or negatively assess a place. So that she's looking for a soft GIS. So, while GIS, Geographic Information System, gives hard facts about the environment, she's trying to give a layer about uh, positive and negative evaluation of people on that environment, so, which I think is very interesting because it brings together uh, information which are more traditionally used for urban planning and decision with psychological information. And this was, uh, we also do this teaching uh, and explanation with uh, architects, uh, especially architects where they are studying, because we think it's very important that this kind of information is brought to the technic technical people, because after all, it's architect, urban planning, engineer, which are going to decide uh, uh, the features of the environment. So it's important that they know it's possible to have this knowledge and use this knowledge to design. So these were pictures in Iran uh, last uh, two months ago when uh, I had a workshop there with students in architecture. And also we have been invited by the United Nations um, to discuss the model. They just published a model about city prosperity index 
uh, which usually tend to focus on technical dimension, but they have also a quality of life. So we, we are also working a little bit with them in trying to let them understand that they need to understand, to, to consider in city prosperity index also uh, this kind of psychological indexes. Um, this was an example uh, in, in Tehran. They have a, a Tehran urban observatory where they use, you can see how, for example, anxiety, depression uh, are much more located in the southern part of the city where the urban condition is poorer than the north part. And they have also general indication for general health. Workplace, a few other examples for workplace. Uh, in, in uh, the West, in um, US and Canada, and something in, we are working a lot on hospitals. So I will give you just example of hospital because hospital is also a working place. Again, general literature tend to focus on how the workplace is a risk place. So how a number of features of the workplace increase uh, negative psychological or physiological consequence and stress. And how this can be, let's say, moderated by personal features. So again, there is a, an idea that the environment more or less is negative, and it's up to the person, you know, with uh, uh, coping features, for example, to moderate this negativity of the environment. But there are some other approaches which look for health promotion. So they're trying to understand when lighting appraisal, for example, is good, is evaluated as good, room appearance improve, pleasure improves, and you have more work engagement. So if you are able to have a better starting point in the environment, you end up in a better position at the end. These are some studies of us. This is actually a research program we have done with Claudia Andrade, a PhD student from Lisbon, but she actually spent part of, uh, one third in Lisbon, one third in Rome, and one third here in the US doing the, her thesis. And we worked on uh, objective and perceived quality in, in the workplace, in the hospital. Uh, and these are cases actually with outpatient, data with outpatient and inpatient. So outpatients are those going there for a very short treatment. And inpatients are those which are staying in the hospital much longer. And this uh, let us understand that, for example, in the case of outpatient, the better the objective environment, the better the perception of the physical environment from the person and the better the satisfaction. So what counts more for in, uh, outpatients, so those that come just for a brief visit, it's the physical environment. What counts more for the inpatient, though they stay longer, it's actually the social quality of the environment. So the social, like care and privacy, etc. So this helps us understanding that also it's the way of uh, uh, time and the kind of activity we spend in the environment uh, which is also important, not simply the starting point of the environment. And we have other data about the effects on uh, uh, personnel. So personnel has uh, different features as well. And these are examples of how we worked out, for example, with concrete example on designing hospitals. We had uh, some collaboration with um, architects in Florence and in other parts of Italy. Just a couple of examples. This was made uh, some years ago. We on the basis of literature, we gave uh, design guidelines to the designers of the hospital, who uh, then designed on uh, also taking care of our design guidelines. Uh, what is now the best hospital in Tuscan region, and it's a pediatric hospital, it's Mayer, it's called Azienda Mayer, and this is the, the actual design that came out after our guidelines with working with the architects. So this is our exterior, and this is our, the interiors of the hospital. So these are real pictures of what is now the hospital like. This is a more recent, uh, again with the same team of architects. Um, we have been working for the Italian Ministry of Health, Health in uh, uh, preparing a huge book giving uh, detailed guidelines on how the hospital should like, with all the specific sub-places of the hospital, about 10 sub-places, with 47 design parameters, which has been built after a research through focus group and questionnaires, and obviously literature evidence. Uh, other work examples, uh, uh, I have uh, not much of time, but, uh, so I'm not going to show the video, uh, but obviously there are much heavier um, work environments such as uh, this Chinese industry I was uh, visiting a couple of weeks ago. Uh, they do um, circuits, electronic circuits for many also Western companies. And you can see in their environment uh, very critical conditions in terms of uh, noise, temperature, humidity, smell, exhalation. 
but also the, uh, what they try to promote in terms of both environmental and social responsibility. It's uh, group belongingness, uh, place belongingness. So there is all the place around is, uh, let's say, scattered with the uh, hints which promotes uh, or a positive link to the group or the place. School is another important uh, uh, issue. Again, uh, traditional literature, I, I think I can skip this uh, first, uh, showing a lot of uh, interest in uh, discipline problems, uh, uh, achievement decreasing in open uh, school, for example, or number of errors, etc. But again, there are examples uh, here in US, but also we have uh, an extensive program in Italy with the CNR, uh, National Council of Research, and this person as well, who uh, built up a network and a real case experience of how activities for children can be changed and improved uh, in a more positive way. And this is, I think, is a leading example in Italy and in the world because people from all over the world is coming, the Reggio children, you may know. And what they say among the fundamental principles you see is the environment as the third teacher. So the environment for them is really part of the educational system. Nature. Nature is another important place, and it's uh, really a lot in fashion now. Nowadays, there is a, a huge literature studying both uh, uh, aware processes but also automatic processes, showing a preference for natural places uh, uh, from people from all over the world. There has just been a, a section just before this keynote uh, this morning already on that. And you can see uh, that, for example, these uh, four features of um, restorativeness in nature are linked to stress reduction and mental rejuvenation. And there is a, a, also an interest in environmental epiphanies now. That is, which are the specific experiences, like peak experiences, especially if they are carried out uh, in early ages, which can bring us nearer to nature and uh, to a positive feeling with nature, positive consequence that we can have with nature, and finally also more sustainable behavior. Again, here we can have a lot of examples of all over the world. This is Copacabana, designed uh, um, by the Marx land, Landscape Planner. This beautiful, uh, huge, four kilometers long uh, uh, pavement uh, uh, promenade, and how people use this promenade for many different uh, issues to increase uh, uh, physical activities. This is in Australia, um, a national park, uh, who is also linking the nature to the history of the place. So sometimes literature seems to focus on nature per se, but what you see around the globe is not nature per se sometimes, but most of the time is nature with people, nature with history, nature with the uh, community. So in this case, for example, this national park in Australia stresses how this nature was intertwined, linked to the local community of the Aboriginal people. And there are, for example, uh, poems, or you can interact with some of these, and so you have not experienced nature per se, but nature again with the uh, human component, or which can belong to the community or history. This is a, a nice example in Africa, in the Seychelles. This is a, a resort which was very much contested, was built recently, because it was going to affect a mangrove forest. So what they did, they, they kept the mangrove forest rather than destroying it, and they involved the local population in keeping cleaning the mangrove forest. And also the, the tourists that come, they are invited to take, you see this brown channel, is the, you can canoeing through the channel through the mangrove and experience what the mangrove and having explanation about the mangrove forest. So you see they basically, uh, what was a risk and a problem for the project was turned into positive things, both for local population involvement and for tourism towards sustainability. This is another completely different example, Scotland. So very cold environment, very desert environment with no people. That's a private uh, um, uh, wilderness reserve. It's called Allerdale. And you can have a, a lot of a, a beautiful experience. And actually, they are working with the Oxford University, also with the, uh, Scottish forestry uh, monitoring the green areas there. You can encounter animals. You can organize uh, school educational activities. So a great, uh, another great example of how you can join nature with educational activities and also with tourism in a po very positive way. This is an example of research actually which shows you a blend of two places, school and nature. We, we did this for the agency for parks in, in this region, which is the Rome region, Lazio. 
And uh, I just want to show you the main results. So the children here were going uh, into one year experience. Some of the activity were into the classroom. Some, uh, some other activity in the parks. And we had two groups, let's say an experimental group and a control group. So one was going into the project, the other one was doing more standard activities. And we measured not simply the children, but also the parents on a number of measures at the beginning and at the end of the year. And we have the results. You see pretest here. Pre-environmental attitudes of the children at the beginning depend from their attitudes, their ethics, their attachment to green areas, things which are known in the literature. But if you look to the post-test, you see participation to little guides enter the equation and becomes a significant predictor. So now pro-environmental attitudes belong not simply to these background variables, but also to the fact that they took part in the program. And the same for ecological behavior, self-reported behavior. Pre-test, they have just standard variables predicting their ecological behavior. After the program, the program is able to predict positively their ecological behavior, so improves. Interestingly, not only the children, but the parents as well. Their parents get affected by the intervention. You see, at least for the attitudes. So parents before the intervention, the attitudes were depending on some variable, background variables. After the intervention, they were positively affected in their attitudes toward the parks. Not for the environment, uh, sorry, not for the behavior. The behavior of the parents is unaffected. But I think very interesting the results also having uh, the attitudes of the parents. Finally, uh, extreme and unusual environments are also, I think, very um, tempting to be to considered into this um, feature because usually you would consider extreme and unusual environments, you know, as what do they have to do? How did this can have to do with positive psychology or positive consequences? You know, uh, and in fact, uh, if you go to uh, uh, they've done this on the Lancet, this huge review of um, especially of polar extreme environments from 75 uh, for 30 years. And they were highlighting a lot of uh, uh, negative uh, issues like uh, somatic symptoms, disturbed sleep, impaired cognition, negative affect. And usually that was the trend and the habit in the literature, just considering that these extreme environments are negatively affecting people. But they were noting that it's possible also having a positive characteristic of a polar environment, natural grandeur, uh, balance of novelty and familiarity, uh, free time. So there were a number of features of the environment which could be considered as positive. And also a salutogenic effect. Uh, you see affiliation, intimacy with others, cooperativeness, excitement, hardiness, improved health. So, you know, they were noting also that some positive consequences are arising even from extreme and unusual environments. And uh, there is also a nice chapter, in, again, in that handbook uh, of uh, Oxford, uh, handbook of uh, environmental and conservation psychologists from Sudfeld, uh, showing, uh, also using some positive psychology uh, construct like flow and peak experience out of mountains experience. So how natural disasters, space station, mountains, but also cultural extreme situation like riots, etc., sometimes can have some positive uh, consequences uh, uh, from a psychological point of view. So uh, in a few minutes I left, just a few concluding remarks uh, uh, from uh, this different blend of uh, researches and examples I throw on, in this, on this uh, audience on this place um, uh, for discussing this. So first of all, some caveat. So of course, culture matters. So it's maybe difficult uh, to say whether uh, an environment is positive or negative in absolute terms. So culture should be taken into consideration. And you can see here how much this can be important in terms of you know, size, colors, and a number of features. I have a, for, uh, maybe I can show uh, uh, just a small uh, few seconds how is crossing a street in Iran? I was thinking to this at the beginning uh, as a negative example, but then uh, after all, uh, I'm not sure uh, if that's the case. So. so this was about two months ago. That was Iran in the afternoon. Uh, sorry, Tehran. Salvage. 
Thank you. So at the beginning I say, well, it's quite negative experience. But after all, you know, I can find some positive, actually, interesting features on that. I don't know whether you would subscribe to the negative or positive side. So uh, it's not easy, probably, or it depends from the culture, for sure, whether it's more positive or negative, or, or this idea of fit misfit with the specific person uh, and specific matching between the person and the environment. Another caveat is for sure gender, you know, it's, uh, uh, and, and more generally, who is going to design the environment? And this, uh, a nice example I found in Istanbul a few weeks ago, she is the first woman ever designed the interior of a mosque. You know, and that's a beautiful mosque, but it's quite different from many other mosques. So perhaps the fact that the environment is designed by certain persons, certain group of persons, has also uh, an important consequences. And this was uh, another example. Again, in, in, in Turkey, this was about religion matters. This was a shot I took in the car after we waited uh, uh, for going out for a parking. And it was, we were stuck in the parking and we couldn't go out. I was asking to my uh, Turkish colleague why. And they explained to me that the parking man was just finishing praying. So we had to wait like three, four, five minutes before going out from the, that place, from parking, because it was praying time. So again, you know, the, the, the way that there was the fit or misfit between those person and the environment can be also affected by a number of uh, features, like religion, gender, uh, groups, etc., culture, which can model or explain how uh, this fit or misfit can happen. So, environment-based design is the general uh, uh, idea that stays behind all this work. The idea that uh, we can help designing and improve the better environment. And we can use actually positive environmental psychology to create better environments. So, uh, we need to look for health intervention and health consequence of the environment in order to improve the way this information arrives to the uh, designing. And another very good example uh, and, uh, is Foodscapes, in, in another chapter in that book, which gives you the idea that this is not a business of very small or medium size or very big uh, uh, scale of the environment, but it goes across all the different possible scales. Because, for example, Foodscapes, uh, they were making the point that depends from the size of your dish and cutlery up to the room, up to the arrangement of the school, for example, or the neighborhood, or the town, the, et cetera. So there are a number of different environmental cues and features, from very small scale to large scales, which help to determine how our food habits, for example. And here we have to remember, you know, systemic lessons. So like uh, Ralph and Brennan contribution, which helped us to understand that our behavior is affected by the place we are in, but not simply, as I was saying before, by the always the specific place we are in, but by the different kind of place we are going through. And actually we are linking those places through our uh, pragmatic system, or we could say through our nomadism. So there is a lot of room, I think, and sometimes here and there in the literature you will find people speaking about flow, resiliency, restoration, um, engagement, satisfaction, happiness, well-being linked to environmental features, but that's not already a systematic effort. So I think there is a big room here for building up, and I think contribution like Coral Verduga has done for sustainability has done something in that direction, but a lot still remains to how to link all these to specific features of the environment with the caveat I just showed you before, show you before about culture and other issues. Um, next year, it's coming also a chapter in Annual Review of Psychology by Bob Gifford, which is the editor of Journal Environmental Psychology. And Environmental Psychology Matters is the title. And I think it's very much, I, I, up to now, it's only the abstract is available, but very much in line with, with the point I'm trying to make in today. And also, this idea that uh, environmental psychology and positive psychology has to join effort, I think is very important for us to matter. Because as uh, we, we have made in a couple of contributions here, which are more theoretical, we have a lot of data from environmental psychology, but sometimes we don't see, we, we are not effective enough to reach 
who decide about the environment. So, for example, in with this paper, we were making the point that, for example, Feng Shui has, you know, much less empirical evidence about the tenets that they are claiming for, but they are much more effective in matter, in, in counting, in, in designing decision, probably, than environmental psychology. So I think there is a room for a good uh, a convergence, but also a collaboration and a reciprocal help from environmental psychology and positive psychology in winning better uh, on these fields. Um, I want just to uh, show that there are a couple of opportunities next year, perhaps, to uh, meet again. Um, I'm in the board of uh, this association, which is the oldest uh, psychological association, uh, Applied Psychology, International Association of Applied Psychology, which has an environmental psychology division. And uh, from crisis to sustainable well-being uh, will be in Paris next year. 8 to 13 July, which I noticed it is just the week after the European Conference of Positive Psychology, which is in Amsterdam. So it's just, you know, one hour by train to Paris. So it could be a nice opportunity to, if you join the um, European Conference of Positive Psychology, there is also this other opportunity one week later and very near. And one week after the U European Positive Psychology Conference, another opportunity could be this, which is an International Association of People Environment Study. Uh, meeting in Timisoara, which is in Transylvania, the western part of uh, Romania. And they have a meeting every two years, so next meeting will be uh, in that place. And that's again in a room where I think these ideas could be developed further. And this is my last slide, and I want just to pay a tribute and homage uh, to places that helped me to uh, be together with Mike that invited me so generously and kindly here today to share my views with you. This is uh, in Tuscany and we met the first time when I was barely 20 years old, uh, 30 years ago in 1984. This picture actually was uh, taken one year later because one year, one year ago in 2012 we met again in Italy when uh, Mike was in the north in uh, Verona, near Verona in Fumane. And so uh, those places were quite important for, because we, we met there uh, 30 years ago and uh, just one year ago when uh, Mike asked me to uh, share my things with you. So thank you very much for the attention and thank you very much, Mike. For the invitation. But, you know, I just wanted to remind you that uh, there's this invitation to join for lunch discussion. If you pick up your lunch at the Pasadena room and take it to the San Fernando room, there will be people from other groups interested also in um, environment and sustainability. So thank you and have a good lunch. Thank you.